So let's start uh, where we left off. And what I intend to do tonight is something that I used to do in 10 minutes, but given what has happened in Jewish scholarship and obviously in the history uh, field of Jewish history, um, it, you can't do it in 10 minutes. And the, the truth is it should have never been done in 10 minutes. And that is that Poland, that same place that we discussed, that wonderful community, yes, it had its uh, issues, but overall, at least till 1648, it, it functioned tremendously well. It designed a methodology where communities would be now replicated up until 2020, where every Jewish child got an education, et cetera, et cetera. And also, if for the first time, Jews get involved in much more than just money lending on a large scale. And the joke always is, if you remember, that's where Jews got into real estate. It all started there with the Arenda system. But there's another story that unfolds in Poland. And the story that unfolds is, is quite fabulous. Well, let me introduce it backwards and then I'll get to it. What I really intend to do today, if you could see it, and I'll put it away, I'm not gonna disturb, share the screen, go back and forth. It's what's known in Yiddish, for those of you who can see the Hebrew, as the Tzenarena. Now, whatever the Tzenarena is, if you've heard of it, just wave once so I should know you know what a Tzenarena is, just a drop. If not, of course, I'll explain it. But if we follow the journey of this book, which comes to be in Poland, um, around 1590, mind you. And we just, imagine if we had a camera almost that would follow this book around until 2020. We would literally go through Jewish history in, in the most interesting possible way. And that's what I would like to do. But before we get to the Tzenarena, <laughs> let me skip to a different book. And if you, it's like I'm selling books tonight. Okay, if you don't own this book, uh, you definitely should buy it. It's the memoirs of Gluckel of Hamelin. And it's a memoirs roughly for about 10 years. You can buy this on Amazon, use books for a couple of dollars. There are a number of great editions. There's a great edition in the original Yiddish. If you want to read Yiddish, it's about a thousand pages in Yiddish with commentary and Hebrew translation. Um, by a great Israeli scholar, Chaba uh, Turiansky, who's an expert in Yiddish. So around 2002, 2003, she published for the first time the actual manuscripts and a really fabulous story. Now, Gluckel of Hamelin is not in Poland, even though indirectly she deals with some things in Poland, but it's the memoirs of a woman, a fabulous woman, um, and you wish sometimes, especially here in Hollywood, someone would take this story and make a movie out of it, or at least a limited series. It's, it's fantastic. It speaks on so many levels. Here's a woman who becomes widowed early. Uh, she's the mother of 14 children. She worries about all of them on her own, remarries, has to figure out the business and she runs a business. But in between her and there, she tells a number of moral stories and there's no doubt that she knew them from the Tzenarena. She was in a different part of the world totally, but she knows them and she relates them in her diary which she left for her children. Incidentally, she describes uh, Shabtai Tzvi because she lives literally during that time period. So she's roughly born around 1640. Uh, the memoirs cover only like um, 17, 16, uh, not a lot, but nine to 10 years of her life. And then uh, around 1724, um, she passes. But why did I mention that? Because Google, 
was influenced by this book, the Tzenarena. The advent of printing, and we've mentioned this so many times, changed the world in so many ways, but it also brought about a revolution that involved Jewish women. And let me explain what I mean by that. In Poland, we've already discussed the involvement where Jews were involved in every type of business. Women too, and we mentioned this briefly last time, and maybe I'll discuss it just a drop more, were also involved in business in Poland. Now, Jewish women overall, back to the Eshet Chayel of Shlomo HaMelech, the Eshet Chayel always made things, sold things. Sometimes she was the breadwinner. Um, in Poland, inadvertently, because of these new economies developing, women have no other option. Um, and many times they have an option and they totally opt into it to enter the business world. It's not just a little petty money lending, but they actually run things in a big way. And they're the ones many times dealing with whoever's on the other side of, of dealing with the business. On a smaller scale, they definitely help their husbands, who were the primary breadwinners overall in Poland. But if, for example, the fellow owned a shop or something at the marketplace, it was the woman who ran it day to day. It was he who went out to get the merchandise, he who went out to get the credit uh, or the products, but she was there, same thing with the store, same thing with the bakery. Jews in Poland uh, own taverns huge taverns and sometimes a whole network back onto that land which was leased from whoever because Yanko got to a good piece of land so let me build something so we build a kretschma if you've heard the word that's the tavern sometimes a jewish tavern and sometimes a non-jewish and jewish tavern and sometimes totally for non-jews and jews were involved in all these businesses but it was the women who prepared the food who, if these taverns had places for lodging, who took care of the rooms. Uh, and many times the husband was away, so she was totally in charge. But something else happens in the 1500s in Poland. And that is that realizing how, again, out of a business, women know Yiddish well. That was their language. Everyone knew Yiddish. The learned men knew Hebrew too. Women did not know overall more than the basic Hebrew that they've learned either at home or actually in a cheder for a year or two. And sometimes we find in Poland women in a cheder just at the beginning to get the rudimentary education of the Aleph and the Bet and how to read. And after that, they're not there anymore. They're at home. But printing is around and books sell. I don't know if they sell anymore today. We they don't, obviously. But in those days, it was just that fledgling market of anything at all. People bought. And lo and behold, oops, apologize for that. Lo and behold, uh, women are a market. They know Yiddish. So I'm not printing Gemaras, Chumashim. Okay, Sidurim I could print. Hmm. Well, let me find a Sidur with the Yiddish. And let me think, what is it that women would read? And things like that you all remember maybe from different editions if you are 4,000 years old like I am. You might remember the Taich Chimish or the Taich Chumash when suddenly the Chumash the Bible, if you want, is translated in Yiddish. But then it gets even more innovative. There were people who took um, stories, and let me just really put them in beautiful Yiddish, and be a writer, be creative, not just translate a text of a story from the Gemara about a particular Tana or Amora. Let me really go to town and describe Rabbi Yochanan. And suddenly in Poland, we find the, the Meisebuch, or the Meisebuchlech, 
where people are just gathering stories, putting them in beautiful Yiddish. They almost sound sometimes when you read Rabbi Akiva and his wife Rachel, it's like a romance novel and how devoted they were to each other. It's almost like, wow. Yeah, that's what they did. And women bought these books and women read these books. And then people went on to Nevi and Rishonim, like Shmuel, but they didn't translate Shmuel. They made Shmuel into an epic in Yiddish. They followed, obviously, the actual Sukim, but in between, they made David HaMelech. Wow, and you should, you read it. Now, sometimes it's totally embellished with the writer's imagination, but women began to read these things. So suddenly there's a market for women in Yiddish and women buy them and women read them. They read them to their children. Uh, parents sometimes who are not that educated buy them and read them to men and women, read them. And then one of these interesting, interesting books in, in the 1500s still is a huge collection known as the Bronspiegel or the Burnt Mirror or the multifaceted, the Spiegel, the mirror. And so someone went ahead and in Yiddish published almost like a glossary of all types of knowledge that a Jewish woman should know. From anything you can mention, even Kabbalistic ideas are suddenly in these books. Um, how to dive in, how to have Kavana, what Kavana means and how to light candles, but a quick one, two, three, but interspersed in between are mentions of names of sources. And suddenly women are now exposed to much more than that. One of the very important books, let me just get it. Um, and again, I'm selling this book, not me, but if you want to buy another fabulous book uh, entitled My Dear Daughter, Rabbi Benjamin, Benjamin Slonek and the education of Jewish women in 16th century Poland. Here is this young rabbi, Benjamin Slonik, who became one of the Godolim of Europe, um, who goes ahead and publishes a book. Now, sadly, this book at the end only was printed once uh, in, the, in the late 1500s and never made it to a second printing. But what he did he looked, what do women need? And he said, you know what? Women need a guide since they're not attending a higher institute of learning. There's no Bet Midrash for them. Why don't I write a book about the mitzvot for women, about lighting candles, about nida, um, when a woman has her period and there's a number of laws that apply to that, quite intricate, and baking challah, and how do you separate challah? So this book, written in Yiddish, um, and in the volume I just showed you, and let me just give you the author's name in case you do, it's Edward Fram, this famous Ted Fram from University uh, of Ben Gurion in the Negev, an, an amazing scholar who's done a tremendous amount for this time period. Um, and all his books are fabulous. <coughs> but he actually recovers this book that only survived in a copy or so from that one print from Yiddish, and he translates it into English. But when you read it, you begin to see the high expectations that this Rob had for, for the women of Poland. And lo and behold, that book is out there too. It never makes it, and by, when it, by never makes it means I don't see there's no second edition, it doesn't get quoted again, but it had an impact for a while, probably 100, 100, 200 copies may be sold, probably not more than that, and eventually it disappears. But then something very unique, very unique and very different happens in Poland. And this puts us now on a very different, again, <laughs> uh, it's Mineket Rivka. Uh, Mineket Rivka, is one of the first known books written in Yiddish by a woman in Poland. Now her name is Rivka Batmeir. This is the very famous Mayor Tiktin of Poland. <coughs> this edition though, believe it or not, 
is published by JPS, but it came out basically through a, a German scholar, some, this woman, Freike von der Roden, oh, who did an amazing job of going and finding this book, which is also quite rare. But this book is very different. Mineket Rivka, written by this woman in Poland, in Yiddish, mind you, in 1609, opens the door for a tremendous amount of women who look at her, read what she has to say, and begin to wonder, can I do anything like that? Now, this particular woman, uh, Rivka Basmeir or Batmeir, in this tiny book, Mineket Rivka, she's not teaching Gemara, she's not deciding Sakh Halacha. It would be what I would call the first self-help book for women of Poland. How to raise children, how to deal with your husbands if they're of this personality or of that personality how to be proper it, it like it, it reads like you kidding me this is what you have to tell them and the answer is obviously look at self-help books today it's like they take a person by the hand and take them step by step so here is this Mineke Drifka, and it goes through a number of editions at the same time and i talked about this once in the lecture some of you might remember probably about four years ago um, and that is something else that comes out of Poland also in this time period, and that is the Tchina. Or the, not the Tchina that you eat, but the Tchina that we, from the word to Davin, a Tchina, a supplication. For the first time, it's in Poland again that we find women composing private prayers in Yiddish intermingled with the, with the Yiddish. And it's quite powerful, and it's not one or two, but it starts a little bit, it's Menachet Rivka that mentions like how to do, how to pray, and here's an example of one. And then suddenly, women whose names we never hear again women who we know nothing about um, begin to write trinos or trinus. And these trinus, to give you the, the Yiddish and the way it was pronounced by these people, um, was very poignant, very moving. And they are little, literally about any aspect of Jewish life. It's the single girl composing a trina to find the right chasen. It's the tachina that the kala says under the chuppah. It's the tachina that the kala says before she goes into the yichud room. It's the tachina that she says during her first year of marriage. It's the tachina for Friday before she lights candles. It's the tachina for Rish Kodesh and for Yom Tov and for baking challah and for going to the mikvah every single occasion warranted at some point. There are hundreds of these trinot out there. Many have been studied, um, but again, it shows you the richness, the, what should I call it, the creativity that suddenly opened up in Poland and women came out there. Now, this was not that unusual um, because Jewish women always prayed and they prayed by themselves. They said what, what they wanted. But now the ones who were able to write them out, and many obviously did, and were educated enough in putting them down on paper and saying to someone, would you publish this? And they get published and they get sold out. And they get sold out again. And then someone composes, and you might actually go online and Google Trinos at HebrewBooks.org or wherever, and you will see all in Yiddish. And these, by the way, travel into Western Europe. They get published in Amsterdam and all the way uh, into England. Women all around want them. 
At the same time in Italy, and we're not doing Italy right now, at the same time in Italy, women are having their own private Sidur input together. Especially women who could afford it would hire someone and have what Art Scroll did not that long ago when Art Scroll put together a woman sitter. Well, a woman sitter was already around Italy uh, in the 1600s with each one. Um, with their own private prayers included in there sometimes, which is really beautiful. Now, not all these tchinas have been published, by the way. I should tell you that hundreds of them are still a manuscript form in many of the Jewish libraries. In the last few years, a number of women scholars um, have actually gone out there and done the research and published some of them, but that's still not yet complete. So imagine, we don't yet have a complete picture of how well documented these, these, this entire enterprise is and how much of this actually has survived, which is, which is again, um, unbelievable. In Poland too, for the first time, we find the Zuggerin. The Zuggerin, anybody know what a Zuggerin is? I, I, I doubt it, okay, Henry, thank you. These were women who knew davening so well that they would be inside the women's section and they would teach the women how to daven and what to say. And they became almost like a chazanit to the women, not to the men, men didn't hear them. But now women could follow along and zog, say after me, and suddenly uh, that happens too. So while the education of men in Poland was of this higher quality. And if you remember allowed even the cloys, like the, the early higher Kolel Elion type of an idea to function in Poland, women too, more than ever before, uh, were beginning to get an education, not because they were in school and not because of anything else, except that the arrival of printing allow them now for the first time to have some availability of learning Chomish or Chemish, knowing the translation and many times learning through that. And that's how they learned Hebrew many times. The Yiddish they knew, but then when they put the word Bereshis next to in the Unfang, they knew, oh, Bereshis means beginning. So if I see the word again, and that's how, you know, of course, the the joke goes when, you know, if, if in these series we get up to American Jewish history, it's kind of fabulous, one of the famous stories that they tell. Now, how the Jews, when they came to the Lower East Side in mass uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, especially after the pogroms and like the Kishinev pogroms, how do they learn English? Okay, everyone spoke Yiddish who needs English. But let, we, got, we have to learn English. We, we can't just talk to our own people. Um, and the way they learned English, well, some try to get an education, try to force themselves, and many did fabulous. But what they would buy is the English Tanakh. And they would learn, believe it or not, uh, King James English. And when you see it, some of their writing, and when you hear a sentence like, when a person was angry, they asked him, what are you doing? And he said, I'm waxing wrath, and wrath with a W. And like, what are you doing? Oh, well, I'm waxing wrath, which meant I'm angry. And you just started laughing at him like, okay, sir, I don't know what language you're speaking because I just tell me you're angry, why are you waxing wrath? And when they used the thou and die, it was like, okay, because you can tell me you and whatever, but don't. In a similar way, women here began to learn the Hebrew uh, through the Yiddish. And then comes this, this amazing book. Uh, let me pull it up again. The Tzenarena. Now the words Tzena Uvera'ena, Benot Zion, or Benot Yerushalayim, is based on a verse in Shir Hashirim, a verse that repeats itself a number of times. Tse'ena, go out. And Ura'ena, and see daughters of Zion, daughters of Jerusalem. Go out and see. So someone <coughs> in Poland 
Again, in the 1500s at the end, 1590 was the first edition of which no copy has survived. A fellow by the name of, <coughs> of Yaakov ben Yitzchak, Ashkenazi from the city of Janov in Poland, somewhere near Lublin. And this fellow, this Yaakov ben Rabbi Yitzchak Ashkenazi, decides to do what hasn't yet been done. He looks at the earlier books of the Maise book, of this Braunschweigel, of these great novels of the, the, the Malachim book and the Shmuel book, and he decides, you know what's missing? What happens if I create now a book on the Parsha give women an overview, quite detailed, of each Parsha. In other words, there's a Taichin here. So it's a certain sense, and it is called this, by the way, it was called the Women's Bible. But what else? Let me include Rashi's in there. Let me include Rabbeinu Bachya in there. Let me include a safe that had just been published, uh, the Cheskuni, one of the great Rishonim who lives about three generations or so after Rashi, and include their commentaries and include a Midrash when there's a Midrash to it and include Musr when Musr has to be said. And let me even deal with the Haftaros. Um, and when I get to the three weeks, I'll write about the laws of the three weeks and explain um, Eicha, and slowly get in this book, literally everything. Now this book, Zeno Re'ena, within the author's lifetime, he himself, with that first edition in 1590, within his own lifetime, this <coughs> Yaakov ben Yitzchak Ashkenazi seized anywhere between seven to 10 editions. Scholars who wrote about it, and so much has been written about it, initially argued and wondered, how many editions are there? So if you read about the Tenorena about 30, 40 years ago, you'll see that it was absolutely unbelievable. This book went through 100 editions. If you look at about 2002, when Moshe Rosman, a great scholar in Israel who writes about this period, evaluated it, he estimated that 100 number was wrong, there's 200. Today in 2020, with much more research into books and their influences and printings that we didn't know about and some were never written down, uh, this book has gone through, through 300 editions. That itself tells you something about the Senna Urena women and men. Now, if I'm not that learned, what do I do? I pick up a book and I read it. It's in Yiddish. I know Yiddish. Everyone knows Yiddish. So suddenly this book becomes the most popular book in Poland. And not just Poland. It now travels, it travels the Jewish world. Every home and without, it's like, you can't even argue with this. Every home, uh, I'd say in the last 300, 250 years, for sure had a Tenorena in it. When sometimes I'm still like someone calls me and says, Rabbi Lima, I have these old books. They belong to my grandmother. I want to throw them out. And somehow I say, well, before you throw them out, there might be a great treasure in there. Don't just throw it out, look what you have, donate it to the library or something. And one of the most common books that people have in their homes and different editions that I've never seen is an old worn out copy of the Tsenarena printed somewhere, not just Poland anymore, because every Jewish home had the Tsenarena. Rabbi, may I? This, yes. is my, this was my mother's Tsenarena. Can you wait till the end? Yes. 
<laughs> I'll stop a few minutes earlier. I apologize. I didn't do this last week. I went like almost overtime, but I'll stop earlier to allow everyone questions and remind me because I would love to see it. Um, so hold on to it. And if you have it, that's quite, quite fabulous. But lo and behold, this book, and that's why I said it to begin with, if we could attach like a video camera to this book, it would tell all these stories. Because in every home Friday night, <clears throat> what was taken out? All week long before going to sleep, what was taken out at Santa Rena? And women suddenly begin to increase their education. They can quote Mamar and Chazal from the Gemara because the Tzana Rena will say, oh, and the Gemara says, and give you a quotation. And they would know the Gemara now. Halacha, davening. Um, incidentally, whatever the author could put in there, he would put, put in there. But why did I say that this book, and let's imagine how great this is. The Taz, I should point out. The Taz in the Shulchan Aruch in Siman Reish Pei Hei Seif Bet, where the Halach of Shnai Mikro Vecha Targum exists, and then eventually the Chavis Chaim and the Mishnah Brewer will quote this too. And that is, every week a Jew has to review the Parsha twice and Targum once. And then suddenly we're told in the Shulchan Aruch that maybe we should go beyond that and add Rashi to it also, make sure we understand the Parsha. The Taz, uh, who dies in, in, in the 1600s, uh, the Taz died the exact same year, the Taz died in 1667, the same year that Shabtai Tzvi dies. <clears throat> That's a separate story in there, um, but since it came up, and it's in my head, I'll share it with you. And that is the Taz was quite ill by then. And when the delegation of Polish Jews went to meet with Shabtai Tzvi um, to see if he's for real, and it looks like everyone believed, and the Taz probably was one of them, the way it's described. His son, the Taz's son, Rabbi David Halevi, who wrote the great commentary to the Shulchan Aruch that we spoke about last week, I uh, wanted to see if this guy is the real thing and hopefully is, and he'll heal my illness. Uh, but the Taz writes in the Shulchan Aruch, in this commentary to this Siman, that those Jews who cannot understand Rashi and can't read Hebrew so well should use the book that is quite popular. So imagine this is in the 1660s where a great posek, the Taz, already knows of the Tzenarena and quotes it by name. When the Chafiz Chaim writes the Mishnah Brura, he copies out these exact words of the Taz and they enter the Mishnah Brura. As if again, <coughs> in the late 1800s, early 1900s, if we still have Jews, and of course we do, and that never disappears, who don't know, but know Yiddish, and let them also read the Tzenarena. What is interesting is the Chafiz Chaim uses this book in a famous letter that some of you might remember from a lecture a while ago about a whole different issue um, about the education of women and the establishment of a Beis Yaakov, which the Chafetz Chaim was behind and part of Sarah Shnira's success was the fact that the Chafetz Chaim had written this letter. It was the last letter the Chafetz Chaim wrote, it was in 1933, and soon after this letter, a few months later, he passes. But the Chafetz Chaim wrote there that women need a school to be educated. And the Chavetz Chaim says, you know why? Because it's not like the earlier generations where women would get their education at home from the mother and from the Tzenarena. So in his time period already, in the Chavetz Chaim's time period, he dies in 1933, there was already a little bit of a, wait a second, this Tzenarena is not as popular as it was. And, and I'll get to that in a minute. But the Tzenarena <coughs> begins to make his journey. In Poland, you could put it among the bestsellers, year after year, one publication, another, each one trying to improve the typeset, make it better. Here and there, 
printers begin to realize that not everybody speaks the same dialect of Yiddish, of the East European Yiddish. We've got the Polish Yiddish, the Galician Yiddish, the Ungarish Yiddish. So in each locality, printers pick it up and begin to absolutely change. They'll look through it, they'll hire a fellow, they won't play around with the content, leave the content, maybe we should add a medrash here or something here, but let's really suddenly use this book to make it popular here because not everyone understands this other dialect of Yiddish and suddenly the Tzenarena is being published simultaneously in different places with slightly different Yiddish translations depending on locality. And believe it or not, already in 1660, there was a Latin translation to the Tzenarena, at least to say for Bereshit, because non-Jews have heard that the Jewish people had this thing that is so popular, some commentary to the Hebrew Bible on Genesis. So on Bereshit, imagine, in 1660, there's a Latin translation and it actually survived. <clears throat> but the book now travels. And as it travels through Jewish history, and it's a period we haven't yet gotten to, but we'll get to in a minute. So besides the linguistic change in Yiddish, what also gets brewing, and maybe we'll touch upon it towards today, end of today, and definitely with Hashem self next week, the last lecture of this, of this four, se- four lecture series, the Hasidic movement comes into being, and the Misnagdim. And the book gets captured by both. Where Hasidim take the Tzenarena and put their Hasidic ideology here and there, mentioning Hasidic teachings. And in the Litvish world, where the Misnagdim, where, well, we're not going to do that. But to make it even more interesting, the book actually gets captured too by the Maskilim, the Haskalah movement, who is very upset about Yiddish. And therefore, you have many editions where the Yiddish is not only not the Polish or the Galiziana, it is the Yiddish of the Bayer of Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn, if you remember, we'll speak of Mendelssohn, maybe a drop today, if not next time. Mendelssohn <coughs> translated Torah <coughs> into German, but he wrote it out in Hebrew as if it was Yiddish. And clearly his intention was to get rid of the Yiddish, to get people to speak this real proper language, German, and of course with Hebrew words in between. But so imagine the Tzenarena now, in fact, one of his students, um, his name was Herzog Hamburg, one of the students of Mendelssohn, is one of the people who took this project on to redo the Tzenarena in a different translation, uh, only in order to teach people to speak a more perfect Yiddish, uh, namely German. And this book is not over. It travels into a number of English translations. One of them was done by by this interesting Jew. Uh, Hershon was his name. Paul Jacob Hershon, who is a Galicianer by birth, lives in England, and for some reason at an early age converts to Christianity, for some reason quite common in England in the the 1800s. Um, The great Bible scholar C.D. Ginsburg, and C.D. stands for Christian David, Uh, also started out in the Jewish world and eventually converted. But this fellow translates um, a number of things, parts of the Talmud, Midra, a very interesting fellow, and he needs a biography. I can't tell you more about him uh, except his name, and he lives in the 1800s. Um, <clears throat> let me just get my drink. But lo and behold, when he translates the book into English, the introduction is almost anti-Jewish. Yet, the book itself is not changed at all, just the introduction. So there he just tells you what he wants to say. Interesting fellow, but okay. So the book even goes there. And as it comes to America, different people translate it, a number of English translations, sometimes only a part of it. Um, Eventually, Art Scroll 
in the early 90s, um, Miriam Stark Zakon translated it in, in an art scroll, had a great set, you know, it's still for sale out there. <coughs> and the art scroll, uh, so to say, canon. Also, of course, travels into Hebrew. How could you have a book that's this popular and not translated into Hebrew? And that too goes through a different, who, who's translating the Hebrew and what exactly is the other agenda that comes through to this translation? So that's why I said initially, this book is so interesting because it really was in a certain sense for us today, maybe you'll understand it better this way. It was for those, for that generation and for those women, much to what Art Scroll has done in their translation of things which are never available to women. And through Art Scroll now, women will, and they have quite in large numbers, approach the Talmud and some other books that they would have a very hard time figuring out. Of course, women's education, Jewish education, has gone through a longer journey than I'm just throwing out there. But the vignettes of the art scroll uh, and the impact it had all over, not just on women, but it clearly had one on women too. So in a certain sense, the Tsenarena is gone. People have it, people buy it. It's still a code word sometimes. Oh, where do you know this from? Or what do you, uh, you know, from the Tenorena? Like you're really so smart. You know, you're nobody. That was, you're, you know, you just got it from the book, which is like, oh, where do you know it from? You know, the Gemara really just, you, know, you read the art scroll. What do you know? Um, but the book today is not what it was. And that book, in a certain sense, had its, it's gone, it, it's set into the sunset, uh, which is really, really kind of sad, but it had its impact. It raised generation of children and women uh, and men to be them educated, know the Parsha, know what's going on. And to this day, much of our vocabulary through osmosis of, of the way we were taught and our teachers were taught and their teachers were taught Many times things came from the Tsenarena, and you can trace some of them quiet. Um, for example, how many, I just wait for a second, that'll be enough, have heard this idea that um, after Hoshana Rabbah, women should take the etrog or the esrog and bite off the pitta. Have you ever heard of that? Okay, if you've heard of it, and it has its sources, but it was popularized in the Tsenarena. It was the Tsenarena that put it out there. Uh, for example, the Tsenarena takes the Gemara, actually it's a Midrash, that speaks of how one spouse can influence the other. The husband makes the woman and the woman makes the husband. Well, not in the Tsenarena. In the Tsenarena, it's the woman who always makes everybody. She is in charge and if she behaves and if she acts properly, then so will her family. All those notions come from the Tenorena and they get passed on. If you, oh, I heard it once, where'd you hear it? Well, my grandmother told me, where did she know it from? Chances are, and they're pretty good sometimes, that they came to her, maybe from her own reading of the Tenorena or someone who learned the Tenorena knew it, um, and, and it came to her. So, <clears throat> The journey of the Tsenaren is over, sadly. Gone through 300 editions. It made its impact. And now, of course, it's a different world for a whole bunch of reasons. And, you know, historians would like sometimes to predict the future. Like, will there be another book that will influence everyone in such a way? And the answer, obviously, is not. We're living in a different world with, with different perimeters, different technology, different ways of communication. Um, and it's who gets their moments of fame for a couple of minutes and then the next one shows up. Uh, it's, it's that kind of a world. But all right, that's a lecture we'll have with Hashem's help in 4,000 years from now. So I'll go on for five more minutes and then, then I'll stop for questions. So what I would love to do um, as an intro to our next session is remind those of us who, again, are 4,000 years old, 
there was a television show on the national educational television, NET, years ago. It was hosted by Steve Allen, if anybody remembers him. And the name of that show was, it was on Saturday nights. The name of the show was The Meeting of the Minds. It was a fabulous show because Steve Allen was an entertainer, a comedian. Uh, he actually hosted The Tonight Show for many years, if you remember. But Steve Allen was also a very bright person. And he was the host of this weekly show. Uh, it was about an hour long. And it was called The Meeting of the Minds, where usually three characters imagine the following. Imagine Aristotle, imagine Genghis Khan and Lenin, all at the same table. Or imagine Plato with Spinoza with some famous pope sitting at the same table. So the actors had a tremendous job to do. They had to not only come in costume of the time period or the person they were portraying, <clears throat> but also had to know everything about them. So if you played Aristotle, you had to know his philosophy well. If you were Lenin or whoever, you had to know your part very well. <clears throat> and I always imagined, and I still do sometimes, and I use it as a vehicle for teaching, like what exactly would have happened if the following three people had a meeting of the minds? Now, the three people I'll mention, excuse me, <clears throat> are not the people who live in different time periods. But imagine if Moses Mendelssohn and, you know, some people say, don't put the two together, but to make my point, I will, and don't get upset anybody. Imagine the Baal Shem Tov and imagine the Gaon of Vilna, all in the 1700s, end up at an inn or at a table, and there is no option but to talk to each other. So there's Mendelssohn, there's the Baal Shem Tov, there's the Gaon of Vilna, all three are drinking L'chaim. What is it that they'll say to each other? And I should just throw it out there, because for those of you who've been on these series with Beth Jacob, remember, uh, not that long ago, at the beginning of the year, when we covered the Dead Sea Scrolls, I make a comment every time I talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, and that is that if you understand what was happening at that time, uh, you understand us in the world of 2020. I'll say it in a different way and more nuanced. If we understand Moses Mendelssohn and the Baal Shem Tov and the Gaon of Vilna, if we understand these three call them personalities, call them great people, call them Jewish thinkers, call them whatever term you like. If we understand what their purpose was, who they were, in which ways were they similar and in which ways were they different, and could they, in an honest conversation with each other, without being recorded and, you know, no fake news in there, an honest discussion, could they have learned something from each other? Because we today, in the Orthodox world, I'm not now discussing in the larger picture of world jury and where we are in history, but if you look at our Orthodox world today in 2020, the prism through which we will best understand it will be these three people. So put that in your heads for a minute. Uh, let me see. Uh, well, I guess you all have, I think you have permission to unmute yourselves. Let me just check, yeah. So Ayala, you had a question? Not a question, I just kind of excited. You spoke about the Tzen Arena. Right. Have volume one and volume two. Okay, you, you can't just do that. You have to open it up inside okay. and see which edition and where was it published. I'll tell you, it was published in Israel. Ah. 
published in 1982. It's the Sinai Publishing House. Oh, Sinai, this, okay. Okay. And just for those who don't know about the book, it does mention Yitzchak from Yanov, right there. Up there, it has his name. I never paid attention because it didn't mean anything. Now suddenly it does. And this talks, uh, it, it, it is with Pninin Yekarim. I guess that's the explanations that it has. Yes. It is the... So one Hebrew, second, Ayala, is it totally yes. Yiddish or is there a Hebrew translation in there also? No translation. It's Yiddish. Translation. But I wanted to say that the Prakim, um, you know, Bereshit bara Elokim et HaShemayim, that's in Hebrew. Obviously, right, right. And then it goes into the Yiddish. And I couldn't, you know, I never looked at it until after my mother was gone. My mother, when she didn't go to shul on Shabbos, used to say, Ech, it's okay. Ech leizman tzen arena. Ech weiß wo es is. Yeah, and that was done all the time. That is as ancient as the tzen arena. That's it. Uh, women stayed home many times, especially in cold winters and didn't wander out to the village shul. They stayed home and read the tzen arena. And the second one starts with Pirkei Avot. Yeah, eventually much more was added in there and it grows. And just a sad note, my husband and I were in Romania about four years ago with my uncle. We stayed somewhere in Mares, I forgot what the name of the place, and we went to shul on Shabbos. Right. And the, it was not a religious shul, clearly. They were renovating this magnificent facade, which the president of the shul was boasting that they spend millions of euros on it. And I said, why? Is anybody coming? And he says, no, but, but people are coming to see it. Well, he took me aside. He took me aside in the little shtibel where we did daven. And there was Nebuch, a pile of books on the floor in the corner. And what do I find? It's an arena. And it must have been, I didn't look at the date. It didn't even, I didn't put one. In. I just, I was afraid to take it. He would never have known I took it. There was a big, huge pile. But I was embarrassed. I'm in a shul. It's a Jewish place. I said, how much would you like for this? And it happened to be, it was Erev Shavuot, and I happened to open, if I tell you, you wouldn't go, exactly about Shviyas. And I said, how much would you like for this? And you know what the answer was? Oh, no, this is not for sale. I said, really? What are you going to do with it? Oh, no, this is a museum piece. <laughs> and that's the end of that yeah, story. So that, that's, that's sad, but that's the history of the Jews in that part of the world. Very sad very sad because That's there's nobody that. coming it was they totally retrofitted to the way it used to look the show anyway that's it i, I just see. wanted to add my Any, two anybody else have any questions or my my mother owned the center Rena. i think joni is sitting there i don't know if she took it from her i and my mother used to read from it every shabbos and incidentally joni's grandmother was a zugerke Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, but not in Poland, in, uh, you know, the area around Chist. Um, oh. And I think my grandmother also did that. But, um, but what, what, what I'm curious about is, I was going to ask you, but you sort of addressed it, which was, well, let me ask first, how widespread was, was the ownership of a book for any Jew because the Jews were based, certainly in Poland, were very, very poor. And did they, you know, and how big were the printings? Was it like 400 copies at a time? In, and in, okay. then if they had that available as a resource, how did, how did they convince the Chafetz Chaim et al to start a base Yaakov if they, you know, if you had that there as a resource? No, but okay, so let's do it backwards. Uh, by the time of the Chavetz Chaim, women want to know much more than just the Tzenarena. 
the Tzenem Ren is just a basic Jewish knowledge of each Parsha and Halacha, and it's really simple level. And that's what the Tzenem Ren provided. In the early part of printing, when uh, usually an edition had roughly, let's say, 1500s, um, a run was about 100 copies. By the time you hit the 1600s, a run is about 500 to sometimes 1,000 copies. Because Jews were in the, in the book selling business, they took carts and peddled books across, across Europe. And the cost slowly and slowly dropped significantly. Uh, even the early books were no longer as expensive, obviously, as having someone copy it out for you by hand. And prices of books just get, get, kept on getting cheaper and cheaper. And people, even poor people, realized, the, hey, we need one of those books. It'll provide, and they would hear from their neighbors, you've got to get a Tenorena. And we hear stories um, where one household had it and everyone ran over to the house of, uh, you know, Peril, Buttel, Gittel, Genendel, because she owns one. And then, you know, and sometimes we hear of requests where the wife would say to the husband, you know, you're always on a business trip to Yanapolev. Why don't you, what, we get bored here without you having you at home. Get us a Tenorena so when you're gone, you know, there's no TV yet. There's no Netflix for these people. <laughs> go ahead and, and read. Oh, okay. You know what? I'll get it for your birthday. And lo and behold, it's in the rent that comes into the house. It was really valued that way. Anybody else? If not, I'll wish you all a whatever. So I can Happy luck, Omer. I haven't counted the Omer yet, so I'm just going to do that right now. Okay. But I, won't, I don't want to say it, but happy whatever it is. Thank you. Thank Thank you Omer. Shavua Tov. And let's, again, let's dive in hard by next week that we all, we're all in Yerushalayim, Yerach Kodesh. And, uh, all the best. Kol Tov. Kol Tov to everybody. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Bye.